Hey, it's Ken Lewis. How are you guys doing? Welcome to Q&A with Ken during the apocalypse. It's uh, Sunday. What is the date? I've been completely losing track of days. March 29th. I couldn't have told you that 10 minutes ago. So, uh, hey, um, we're live on tonight's broadcast. I'm Ken Lewis. For those who don't know who I am, uh, I am kind of a jack-of-all-trades, kind of a chameleon, uh, I'm a mix engineer. I kind of came up as a tracking engineer, mix engineer, uh, producer, but I'm also an arranger, studio musician, vocalist, teacher, now broadcaster, uh, all sorts of things. So uh, credit-wise, I've got 99 gold records. I'm pretty sure I can uh, drop some gems on you tonight. I'm going to be trying to do that. I'm going to be trying to answer as many questions from the chat roll as possible, as well as uh, pre-submitted uh, questions. Uh, let's see. So tonight's going to be nostalgia night, uh, 90s nostalgia uh, specifically. So, you know, I kind of came up in New York City in the studio scene during the 90s and was staff at uh, Soundtrack Studios uh, in Manhattan from 93 to 95 and went freelance in 95 and have been working the New York scene ever since. And uh, so I'm going to talk a lot about that tonight. Uh, I'm going to talk about the coronavirus, of course. <laughs> That's going to be a biggie on tonight's broadcast. Uh, I'm going to tell a few stories, maybe tell a David Byrne story. Definitely going to tell some New York studio scene stories. Uh, let you guys know how it used to be kind of coming up in, in my world compared to how it is coming up now. I think, you know, so many people ask me questions <laughs> that are, you know, how, how do you get started? How do you find work? How do you whatever? And... I think the, the thing that a lot of people need to uh, realize when you're asking somebody like me at that level is the way that I came up and the way that I got work and the way that I get work now is completely different than the way you're going to ascend, that you're going to find work uh, and you're going to establish your career. So uh, I'm not even sure how many uh, nuggets I have as far as, you know... Huh, mm as far as uh you know dropping gems uh in that regard um but i'm going to talk about it um let's see i'm going to start the q and a uh what studio monitors do you use and why so so let me back up so first of all uh, we're still fleshing out some of the tech. I think we've got everything mostly solved. But one of the things when you guys submitted your questions uh, pre-broadcast, uh, it didn't include your names or your email addresses. So my apologies. I have no idea who's asking these questions. Uh, but I'm going to answer them anyway. So uh, we'll pile into them. Um, Ken, what studio monitors do you use and why? Uh, well... Uh, I use Atom A7s. I don't use the A7Xs. Uh, I've just been using A7s since before they did the Xs, and I have no reason to change. So, you know, when the drivers get old, I just swap them, and I have two pair of A7s on top, and then uh, I have a pair of uh, JBL 4312 subs underneath. So I've got uh, stereo subs and stereo A7s. So, and so, and the the basic point behind stereo subs is accuracy when i crank this shit up in my studio if i'm mixing a club track or a heavy 808 hip-hop track or something i need to know exactly what that feels like and i i can't have my subs folding up on me and you know not being able to carry the low end and distorting because i don't have enough power down there so that's why i'm running two subs um all right Question two, what's the best remote recording software to use uh, to record someone in another location? Man, if anybody has an exact answer to that question, please tell me. So we are researching a ton of um, different formats right now as far as how to do not only remote recording, but be able to kind of see each other and be in as close to real time as possible. Not playing along with each other, but I want to have the ability to, for instance, produce a vocalist who is not in my studio almost as effectively as if the vocalist was here. Because we're going to be under quarantine for quite some time. 
Um, anybody who thinks this is going to end anytime soon is kidding. Uh, so, you know, I want to be able to keep producing all of the artists that I'm producing and, and, you know, keep sending mixes to clients and whatnot. And, uh, so I'm looking for the best screen software. We've tried Source Connect. That's really hit and miss. You need to be like a damn, uh, computer tech in order to set that stuff up. And I think we've tried Wirecast and that seems to not be all that great. So we're still looking. If you got any recommendations, fire them away. Um, <laughs> Uh, question three, when do we eat duck again? I have a feeling that I know who that's from. It's probably the Toulouse uh, contingent of uh, my uh, France friends. So every year, uh, not this year, of course, um, but the last three years uh, in the springtime, um, March, April, or May, I think, uh, I've gone out to Toulouse, France to teach a one-week master class uh, at ISPRA. Um, great school, great students, great staff. I really love it out there. And anytime I'm in France, you know, duck is one of my favorite foods. Um, duck magret. And, uh, uh, so, so, and I identify being in France with eating duck. And I've been to France a whole bunch and I would love to go back. Um, so when do we eat duck again? Hopefully really damn soon, man. Let's hope this quarantine clears and, uh, you know, we can get back on track and start socializing again. Um, all right, so uh, I'm going to... Am I going to... What am I going to do? I'm going to go to this uh, 1176 thing that I set up. So, uh, for those of you who don't know, I have a school, Audio School Online. Uh, there's, there's a tutorial on Audio School Online called Classic Compressors that's uh, been one of the favorites. And this is kind of uh, similar to a test that I that I set up and performed uh, in that tutorial. And so basically what I did was I set up eight different 1176s. And the point of this, and I set every single 1176 up with the exact same settings on the dial face. So if you see minus 48, plus 12, uh, attack is noon, and release is 7. And this is 4 to 1 ratio on every single one. So the ones that I've chosen are UAD Rev A, UAD AE, uh, UAD LN Rev E, uh, what is the next one? Um, Black 76 IK Multimedia. I use this one on the uh, uh, Jeremiah 50 Cent Down On Me mix. Uh, this one went on Jeremiah's lead vocal. Uh, the CLA Blue 76, uh, the CLA Black 76, the Bomb Factory 76, and the Slate uh, 116. So all of these, again, same input, output, ratio, attack, release, and so, and I want you to listen for two different things. I'm going to pull up, uh, hang on. Okay. So, two different things. I want you to listen to how radically each different plugin reacts. And how different a whole bunch of these different 1176s actually sound. And the point of this is kind of... Um, everybody uses emulations. Most people, I love them. Um, but when I use an emulation, you know, people say like, oh, I want the sound of an 1176. Well, you're about to find out that that means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. So these are set up in order. I have uh, from left down. So compressor one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and then eight was over here with the FG-116. So listen through. You're going to see the meter deflect on each different compressor. And just listen to how every single one treats this signal completely differently. So here we go.
So as you can see, there is no such thing as the sound of an 1176. I have eight different sounds set up uh, for the same drum loop. Uh, everybody seems to be gain staging their inputs differently. Everybody seems to be gain, you know, gauging their reactions differently. There's different model types. There's different everything. So, you know, keep in mind uh, that when people think about all of these modeling things, that you know, really, what you're, it would be more accurate to say, you know, I want a fast FET compressor, or I want something really aggressive. Uh, with a you know super fast a medium fast attack time something like that um, is I think a better way to uh, to think about the 1176s. Now I wanted to show you since I'm doing all of this one more run through, and that is with um, so I have 1176. Uh, I copied all of those and I just did an all buttons. <clears throat> um, and I wanted, uh, for those that don't know the all buttons trick on the 1176, anytime you're using a real 1176 or the plug-in, they all do the same thing, mostly. Uh, when you press in all four of the buttons at once, see there's only the, the plus four, plus eight, plus twelve, or the twenty to one ratio, these are all ratios. If I highlight all four of them and click them, then I get some super extreme results. All the same setting. Well, this is game stage really weird. It's barely touching the black 76. There's your 1176 test of the day. It's, you know, my favorites are the UAD ones, although I'll go for the uh, uh, CLA Blue um, sometimes uh, as well. And that seems to be kind of grabby in ways that I like, and, and you can get it to pump pretty well. Uh, in fact, where is the, is it here? No, that's the black. Here's one absolutely fascinating thing for me about 1176 uh, modeling. The, the, in some instances, the 4 to 1 is more extreme than 20 to 1. And I, I think that might be because of the knee. I'm not really sure. Um, but uh, the other interesting test would be comparing 4 to 1 to 20 to 1. Because a lot of times, 4 to 1 on the 1176 grabs a lot harder than 20 to 1. And you would think it would be the other way around. The SSL bus compressor does the exact same thing. Uh, okay, let's go back to the questions. Um, how do you make newer sounding music with vintage elements commercially viable? And how do you make vintage elements in music sound authentic and not pander to nostalgia? Uh, vintage elements commercially viable, vintage elements authentic and not pander to nostalgia. I think uh, a lot of that is taking care with searching the right sounds. Obviously, any time that you can get quality studio musicians to give you a certain thing, I would highly recommend that. Um, uh, I just used a phenomenal uh, Hammond B3 player named Marcus, I can't remember his last name, unfortunately, in uh, Germany, who just played on a Harlor song that we're producing, and absolutely killed it. It brings... Like this energy and this, uh, 
I don't know how you want to say it. Um, it, it brings something to the production that I couldn't have done myself with, uh, you know, a, a, an organ plug-in and 10 hours of trying to get mood into it. It just wouldn't have happened because I went and found the artist on the B3, gave them my, hey, this is how I want you to play. This is what I, this is how I wanted to make me feel, that kind of stuff. So, um, uh, they gave me the nostalgia that I was looking for without me having to do much. Uh, I hired the right person for the gig. That's like the kind of the Quincy Jones style of production is, you know, get the right people in the room, guide them well. Uh, and, you know, it's still, as a producer, you're responsible for the end result. So... Whatever's, however that thing is going, at the end of the day, whatever gets turned in or released or whatever it is, um, that uh, is, you know, the producer is going to be judged by that. So if you can get the right players, get the right players. If not, you know, there's filters and saturators that I think are great for this kind of stuff. If you shave off some top end, you know, here's a, let me show you the decapitator for this kind of stuff. So I'm not doing a, a ton to it, but I'm giving, you know, I'm giving this, this is the kind of stuff that I would experiment around with on each individual instrument, not just drums. I don't feel like this is making it sound super retro, but the, the breakbeat is already kind of retro feeling anyway. Um, so all I'm doing is bringing out some of the, the kind of the dirty ambiences and stuff in the actual recording, which I think a lot of the reason people love breakbeats is because of the ambience around the drums. It's you just can't recreate that shit out of the box. It's got this feel. And of course, the playing is like breakbeats are never perfectly on grid. There's always this kind of subtle timing thing about the way breakbeats feel that makes those things special and sought after. Um, and that's why we use them. So, so keep the questions coming. Uh, let me see some questions on the chat roll and I'll get to them. Um, I'm going to answer the next one on here. Um, so one more thing about vintage elements, I think. So filtering out lows, highs, adding some, you know, mono plate reverb sometimes, mono spring reverb sometimes stereo plates or springs can be really nice too you, you know you try all of these things in subtle ways and with you know without hearing what the source is i can't possibly tell you how to treat it and what to do with it but it's a vibe and i think uh you know when you're being authentic and you know when you're trying so hard and you want it to sound real but it really just sounds like a fake piano coming out of a fake box and no amount of eq is going to fix it that's when you just got to get better sounds and you know when you guys are competing production wise you're competing production guy wise with guys like us who i mean we have fucking super dope sounds uh and everybody has splice so you know i, I don't know any producers who don't use splice um it's just one of those things that it's convenient. I think the convenience factor is it for me. I, I really wish the splice uh, search functions were much better. Uh, I find it really difficult to find super usable stuff really fast. I I find, you know, collections of shit that I got to pour through 80 or 90 percent of the crap to find anything that remotely resembles a gem. But, you know, that's that's how you find the gems. And uh, 
you know, I get that question a lot about, you know, how where how and where do you find your sounds? Man, there are high quality sounds everywhere now. If you don't have them, go find them. Um, okay. How do you approach finding and developing new... Okay, this is a new question. I don't know who from, sorry. How do you approach finding and developing new artists as a producer? Uh, well, um, mostly they find me. Uh, I've been super, super lucky that way. Occasionally I have found them. Um, I mean, I think me and my team in general, we've always got our ear out for you know, some surreal next level talent, but, uh, that's where the bar is set. Surreal next level talent. Uh, that's what we're looking for. You know, when I, when I'm, um, determining who, uh, we want to develop and, and, you know, how much we want to go in on that. Um, I need to get that goosebumps feel, man. I need to be like, wow. And not only do you need the wow effect, you need the wow, I love this, it connects with me, I would really enjoy developing this music over the next year or three, because that's what it's going to be. Um, and, uh, and you're passionate about it, and you have a vision for how to get it out there and into the marketplace. I mean, if you're developing an artist, but you have absolutely no idea where they fit into the marketplace... That might be really difficult um, to uh, get, you know, a toehold in streaming or something like that. And, you know, speaking of getting a toehold in streaming, uh, playlisting, I think, is if you can reach out to any playlisters in a really short, condensed, professional way, you should... I mean, be if you're an artist trying to make some shit happen for you, the playlisters is where I would be starting first. That and just always be in touch with your uh, fan base and and know that part of your job is to build your fan base and connect and and communicate with your fan base as as a new artist, as any artist, but you know as a new artist. So, um, so that's how we find them, and then once we've found uh that special artist that we're super excited about, which right now is a group named Harlor. Uh, Harlor is a couple 23-year-old guys, Nick and Max, out of uh, Pittsburgh and Cincinnati. Now they, they're living up in this area now. And uh, we've been working with them for about six months now. We have super, super high hopes for them. Uh, incredibly talented artists, uh, self-starters. They write a lot of their own stuff. Um, I mean, they start all of the songs and then, you know, a lot of times they'll uh, bring them to us and, and Catalyst, me and my production partner Brent uh, Colatalo are the production team Catalyst, in case you don't know. Um, and, uh, you know, they'll bring them to us and we'll produce them out and, until it's a finished record. So, um, you know, I think you got to be passionate about it. I think you have to see a vision for it. Vision is a really important thing in this industry, period, especially as a producer. Uh, okay, next question. How to get crystal clean vocals? <laughs> uh, well, uh, I would say the, the first step in getting crystal clean vocals is to get a crystal clean, amazing sounding microphone. And, uh, I certainly have a couple of them, um... The uh, C800G, Sony. So the C800G is a tube compressor. Uh, so tube compressor, Jesus Christ, Ken. Is a tube condenser mic. So it's got a it's got a tube, um, but it's also a condenser, large diaphragm. It's, it's the one with the big fin, uh, the black fin off the back of it that looks like a machine gun. Um, so virtually anybody I've ever recorded with the C800 already sounds crystal clean. So for me, that is step one. Uh, and if I record with the C800, usually I have to do a lot less during the mix. You know, everything is already there. It's clean, it's clear, it's present. Um, and the great advantage of that is if I then want to make the vocal super crystal clean and clear, I can do that. If I want to dirty it up, I can do that. I can take it any direction that I want to go because my source is super high quality. 
Now, if you're given a shit source and uh, and you need to clean it up, then I mean, uh, you know, Soothe is a pretty cool plugin nowadays. Um, uh, I think Oak Sound has Soothe. If you don't know it, check it out. I can't really show it to you right now, but I can. Uh, there it is. So what Soothe does is it it uh, analyzes. Let me see if it'll just. Yeah. So you're going to have to imagine that this is a vocal, and if you see, it's taken a bunch of really tiny cuts uh, in real time out of the drum loop. And if you imagine a vocal going through that, what I, th I think basically what it's doing is it's looking for these ringy, piercing frequencies uh, and dialing them out as they come from whatever frequency they come from. So what you get is this kind of soft taming of a lot of the harshness uh, in your lead vocal uh, with Soothe that usually I'll, if I use this, I'll usually use it after compressor, EQ, DS, or Soothe. Um, and, uh, and it helps dial out some of the nastiness. The other plugin that I use a lot to just dial out the crap is the Waves Q6. You can get super tight band with it. You can kind of go search and destroy frequencies and, you know, sweep where you want, figure out what you want, and then just pull it out. And usually if I'm pulling out specific tight little ring frequencies, shit that should not be in the signal, but is like a flaw in the diaphragm of the microphone, or the vocalist has some weird ringy overtone in their vocal that is not part of their overall voice it happens all the time um so i might go to like a super q like this like 78 and maybe that's at 3300 and i usually i would dial out i don't know anywhere from maybe four to eight of whatever that nasty frequency is um you don't want to dial all of it out you want to dial enough of it out that it doesn't bother you anymore but that you don't lose that tone in the voice because you can start dialing out a lot of different notches and then the next thing you know the vocalist sounds completely different you've changed the way that they sound uh, so we're uh, trying to avoid that so first um, compression unless it's really muddy or something like that and then I would um, you know clean it up uh, I would only put the EQ before the compressor if if the microphone they used or the vocalist or whatever about the recording is really needs to be adjusted before it even sees a compressor and a lot of times that might mean that the vocalist was too close to the mic and has you know too much proximity effect too much proximity effect um and uh and that brings up you know proximity effect is when you get closer and closer to the microphone the low end of whatever is in front of the microphone increases um so sometimes that will make a lead vocal if the vocalist is too close to the microphone sound muddy or tubby or you know smeary or whatever those adjectives are to describe uh the low end uh you know kind of lower mids and and muddiness and what that uh that sometimes you need to clean out so if there's a lot of that i might clean that out before i hit it with a compressor if there's room rumble or you know uh, breath pops or something I may uh, high pass filter it above say if it's a girl probably above a hundred if it's a guy probably above 70 or 80 uh, there's really not much down there but you got to be careful uh, because you can filter out too much and you can lose things that you need and speaking of filters I don't really um, uh, I don't use filters all that much I only use filters to clean things up when I hear a need for it um, but that also goes back to, I'm running dual JBL 4312 subs, and when there's a problem in the sub frequencies on a vocal or, or a background or something like that, usually I feel it. So if I've got those vocals soloed, I'll feel it in my pant legs with the, with the uh, bass coming off of the subs, 
Uh, and then I know to clean it up and, you know, and do something about it. Um, so, uh, hopefully I've given you a whole bunch of shit to... <laughs> I'm not sure if I... I'm pretty sure I answered that question. Uh, okay. Uh, let's go to the chat roll. Um, actually, there's not much there. Uh, more questions from... Uh, da, 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 uh, okay. Something's wrong with the chat roll. I don't know what it is. Uh, but I have more questions um, that have been emailed during registration. So, uh, what advice can you give an emerging female rapper, uh, female rapper producer, about the mainstream industry and how to get her foot in the door? What are the key elements of the lyrics and production that make a chart-topping hit song? Okay, let me, let me tackle the first half of that. Uh, I'm not sure I'm the authority on that. I haven't worked with a ton of female rappers, um, but there have been a few. So, uh, emerging female rapper producer. Well, I think job one, if you want to get noticed and, and, uh, and you want to further your career, is to make sure that what people are hearing from you is great. That you press play and people are like, I'm fucking with that. That shit is hot. And, uh... Don't play it. Don't play your stuff for your friends and get their opinions. You know, get some opinions of some people who are not just going to bullshit you or not just going to be like, damn, I, I never expected you to sound that good. <laughs> like, that's not where the bar is set. Um, you know, uh, but I think if you're a rapper producer, you have a golden opportunity to create your own sound and uh, blaze your own trail. And the perfect example of that is Kanye West. Uh, when I started working with Kanye, it was 2002. And uh, he was still just a producer. He was not an artist yet. I did not know he wanted to be an artist until the first time I ever got in the same room with him and uh, working in a studio. Then it was, I mean, immediately obvious. Uh, but he, ev first of all, just uh, I'll give you the, the quick, everybody discounted Kanye. Nobody thought, you know, everybody looked at Kanye back then and was like, oh, he's just a, a, a producer who's trying to do the artist thing. Nobody looked at him as, oh shit, he's an artist who can also produce. He just happened to produce first. So production can help get your uh, foot in the door um, to develop your artist thing. Uh, the, he started bringing other people in to help create his sounds. But clearly, the, the, the man is gifted enough to produce all of his stuff completely on his own. And when he first got signed, nobody, and I mean nobody, sounded anything like him. But here's the key thing to remember. Nobody sounded like him, but the shit was so immediate and connective and like i mean so the first time i was in the studio with with kanye we were up at quad studio a and he was producing a memphis bleak song memphis wasn't there um and i was there doing music and i just had my guitar there was a an engineer from quad at the console running shit and i was just there to put down music and kanye was sitting on the back couch with a couple of his boys just rhyming non-stop and i i mean instantly anybody who heard him rhyme that night would have been like Holy shit, this guy's a fucking artist and a half. Everybody discounted him, and then he proved them all wrong. So make sure what you have is great. That's number one, or at least really good, and work yourself into great. You know, maybe collaborate with other producers that you really respect, and, you know, see what kind of uh, enhancements they might or might not uh, bring to your own artistry. Um, you know, uh, I have a production partner. I collaborate all the time. I think it's, uh, I don't think it's super important to collaborate. I think it's super effective for the right people to collaborate together. And you just got to find the right people that you connect with. Uh, and you know, you may go through 10 or 15 or 20 collaborations before you're like, it's just, this is so natural. Like we both either think completely differently and complement each other well, or we both kind of have the same sensibilities and we can bounce ideas off of each other effectively, you know, whatever it is. 
Um, okay, so, and then the other thing is, what are the key elements of lyrics and production that makes a chart-topping hit? I mean, we all have heard the radio and scratched our heads and gone, how the fuck? Um, so, I'm not going to talk about the songs that make it to the radio that we're just like, I don't know. I don't get this, you know. Some of it's pop culture, some of it's, you know, record companies just pouring uh, um, money into it and determining that, come what may, this song will be a hit. But uh, to me, the key elements are: uh, do you does it con does it connect with you quickly? Especially if you're a new artist. If you're Drake, people are gonna wait thirty seconds for you. If you're not Drake. People are not going to wait 30 seconds for you. So get to it. Don't have all these super long intros. Um, and get straight to the hook if you can. Um, if you can't, then, uh, you know, make sure your arrangement is, is tight and that you're kind of uh, not... Uh, I'm going to try and bring up a sprint mix. Hang on. That I showed this a couple weeks ago. Boom. Where is it? Um, I think it's this one. Um, a song called Hype Man. That so I'll play. I showed this the other day, but the, I'm ready. the intro to this is like no. almost a minute, and this is a new artist, Bonnie. Um, it's a club track, and it's called Hype Man, and it's not hype yet. In the club, yeah, you know me I'm still like, this is the demo. This is before I got a hold of it. But we're like 20 seconds in, and there's not a whole... Okay, so now, 22 seconds in, we got the drums. But we still are going with this, like, as a listener, at this point, you've totally lost me. I'm not interested anymore. And you can't bring me back. And then the first verse... So, first verse comes in at 44. So, that's a lot. Um, and what I did was I just cut off the first part of it. I'm going live all night, man. In the club, yeah, you know me, I'm the hype man. I'm the hype man, you know I'm the hype man. I'm the hype man, yeah, I'm the hype man. I'm the live all night, man. In the club, yeah, you know me, I'm the hype man. So that's like uh, 22 seconds in. First off, it starts with the chorus. So you're into the chorus in second one. And you're into verse one in 22 seconds. So by 22 seconds, you've already heard an entire chorus, and you, you now you're into the verse. Whereas before, you had this meandering kind of thing going on, and you didn't hit the verse until 44 seconds. Arrangement really matters, especially if you're younger and you're trying to catch ears quickly. That is not always the case. Sometimes long intros work, even with unknown and unsigned artists. I think the absolute best example of that is uh, Des Rocks. So me and Brent, uh, we're Catalyst. Uh, we produced um, two EPs for uh, a new artist named Des Rocks, rock guy. Um, the uh, Martyr Parade EP and the Let the Vultures In EP. The, s the second? Third. The third single we ever released for Des Rocks was a song called Let Me Live, Let Me Die that has this hella long intro. It's got like a 40-second intro, but it's like this super high-energy shit. And we kept editing down the intro because we were like, man, this is just too fucking long. People aren't gonna whatever. And finally, we made the determination that, you know what? The intro is super dope. It does exactly what we wanted to do. It makes you feel exactly the way we want you to feel. So we're going to keep it come what may. And it was the best decision we ever made because that song has taken off like in unbelievable ways. This is still completely independent. And uh, let me see if I can get Des Rocks. And Let Me Live is at 33 million streams on Spotify alone. And this is all indie. And we've licensed the fuck out of it. We've licensed to... 
Uh, we had a trailer for Amazon The Boys Season 2. We had the Shameless trailer with that. We had a Borderlands 3 trailer with that song. And so it just goes to show you, you know, follow your gut, and but be willing to be upset when your gut lies to you or the general public doesn't really care what your gut thinks. Um, that one worked out really, really great for us. We were debating up until the night before it came out if that was going to be the song to put out. And we were like, yep, that's that's the one, let's do it. And, man, super long intro, but there it is. Uh, okay, um, another question from uh, registration sign-up. Uh, if you could produce an entire album using one vintage analog keyboard, what would it be? Uh... A Mellotron? <laughs> I mean, is that is that a, an acceptable answer? I would definitely use a Mellotron. Um, because you can get um, all of those uh, different tapes for it. Um, well, I don't know what you could get for an original Mellotron, but that, that would be my uh, easy answer. Uh, if the... Anybody who hasn't heard the... Somebody built a recreation of the actual Mellotron, and it's this big box. It's like two, $3,000. But the sounds in it are so much better than the soft synth um, Mellotrons are. It's just night and day. And uh, our artist, Grizzly Adams, has one. And so we've used it on a bunch of his stuff. And just the sounds that come out of that thing are phenomenal. So... I'd probably use that. Some of my other favorites, I don't know. All the analog stuff, I kind of just use the modeling and poke around until I find really interesting shit and then start turning knobs until it dials into what I want it to exactly sound like. So I'm not really into the brands and stuff like that on old synths. You know, I'm a, I'm a guitar player by, by trade starting out, so that's my kind of my main uh, thing. Okay. Uh... Da, 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 da. All right. I don't know why the live chat is not going. Maybe nobody's asking any questions. Is nobody asking a single thing? Um, okay. So what else did I want to talk about? I wanted to talk about the 90s studio scene for anybody who cares. Because, <laughs> uh, boy, it was a different world. Um, so... Uh, I got to New York City in May of 1993, uh, right after the first World Trade Center bombing. I don't know who remembers that, but I think January of 1993, um, some terrorist uh, let off a gigantic bomb in the parking garage of uh, World Trade, and <laughs> and then I moved up, and then you know the rest is history. So, 93, I started at a studio called Soundtrack. It was right in Midtown on Broadway and 21st. Uh, it was a nine-room facility, so they had nine separate music studios. And they had uh, artists coming in all the time who weren't bringing their own engineers in. And so once I kind of made it up to tracking engineer status, I was the guy who they were putting a lot of these sessions as the tracking engineer. So... A lot of people, when you're asking me, uh, you know, how do you get your start? How do you come up? How do you find work? Man, you're trying to find work as a freelancer before you have the credits to be freelance. That's the problem. Um, I went the old school traditional route and I started uh, at a studio and uh, worked my way up that studio and made myself valuable to that studio and made myself valuable to the clients who uh, came in to, to work at the studio and with me uh, and spent two and a half years there building up my resume, building up my credits, saving up money, getting contacts, meeting people. And then, you know, two and a half years of that and, and off I went to freelance world in 1995 and I've been freelance ever since. Um, but if you're a freelancer, you got to give people a reason to hire you. And the thing is that probably 90% of the people that hire me for the first time hire me because of the credits that I have, uh, compiled and the work that I've done on those credits. Um, they hire me for repeat business because of the quality of job I do, I hope. Um, 
So, uh, that's some insights for you. Uh, let's see. What else is, uh... Oh, okay. We got another question from the uh, registration roll. Uh, what's your favorite way to record acoustic guitar? Um, I, you know, there's a, a few different things depending on what kind of song it is and what I'm going for and... Uh, mood and things like that, but I have my main acoustic now is a Taylor C710, I think. It's pretty even, it's a little bit bright, but it's pretty full. And um, usually I will put the C800 at about right where the neck of the guitar meets the body of the guitar because there's enough uh, sound coming off of the sound hole, but it's not direct, so you're not getting. Uh, the actual sound blowing into the microphone like um so off of the sound hole but close enough that you're really catching you know part of the body of the guitar part of the strings part of the pick attack you're kind of getting the whole thing and about you know 10 inches to two or three feet away depending on how uh, close up or how much room and ambience that you want in that recording. And then you have to be really careful about how woofy and and uh, how much lower mid um, muddiness is coming out of the guitar. Sometimes it's a ton. Sometimes it sounds really thin uh, with that microphone. And one thing that you'll be really surprised with if you're micing acoustic, once you have the microphone in place, what you should do is uh, tell your player to very slowly, so if the microphone, so say my microphone is this microphone and it's at acoustic level. If if this is right where the acoustic, can I do this? No, I don't know where my acoustics are. Um, I do. Hang on. All right. So. About right here, and or start moving it back from there, depending on how much ambience you want. And then have your player very, very slowly rotate their entire body and, gu and guitar and play through the entire range of where you have them sitting and see what sounds very best to you. Uh, because it's probably going to... Be different for every guitar. Uh, sometimes I'll even have the player play and I'll just walk around the room and listen to the sound of the guitar while while they're playing and sometimes that tells me like oh this is a great sounding spot it's nice and even everything comes together frequency wise right in this place and I'll put the microphone there and wherever there is it could be super close or three or five feet away you just don't know. So C800G the other thing um, I'll use like an AKG 451 small diaphragm uh, condenser mic on acoustics regularly. Uh, and the other thing I really like on acoustics is ribbon mics. Um, ribbon mics tend to take EQ really well. So uh, uh, you can really um, brighten up uh, and dig into a ribbon mic with EQ and sometimes in ways that is a little bit more difficult with a condenser. And uh, uh, let's see. What else do I use for... So, yeah, I would say mostly um, those are my go-to mics. This one, the Cascade Fathead 2, uh, the AKG 451, or a good high-quality small diaphragm condenser, or a good high-quality large diaphragm condenser like the C800G, or U87 would be an excellent choice. You know, the Slate mic would be an excellent choice. There's a bunch of them. Uh, okay. What else do we have on the chat roll? Da, da, da. How do I start? Okay, this is from the chat roll. Uh, I'm really sorry. I don't know who's asking these questions. Uh, I'm trying to figure out all of the technical um, issues with the broadcast. Uh, uh, when you're submitting questions, unfortunately, it doesn't carry your name. So all of these questions, I don't know who asked what. Sorry about that. Um, okay. So, how do I start writing music for major artists in the industry? Well, I think uh, the first thing to try to do is reach out to other writers who are on the come up, 
So from the, <laughs> let me back up. The first thing to do is put a lot of time on your own writing and improving your skills before you try and collaborate with anybody else. Get your weight up. You know, really uh, challenge yourself. And once you feel like, all right, I'm really writing some good shit right now. Then you start reaching out to other songwriters, uh, you know, other producers, if you're a writer, and just, you know, reach out. Hey, I love your productions. I would love to do some top lining on your uh, song sometime. What do you think? You know, no strings attached. Let me write something and, and see if you love it. You can pitch it to major labels. If you don't love it, then it's not going to go. Um, and I, I, we've met a lot of co-writers. We've met co-writers that we've gotten cuts out of that way. Um, you know, if you're dope, people like me usually recognize, but if you are going to reach out to somebody, A, tell them as, keep it as short as humanly possible. Tell them, be very professional, address them by name, sign your name, um, and tell them exactly why you're emailing them and what you want. Hey, I'm a young songwriter. I think I got crazy skills. Uh, I want to show you what I can do. Can I, you know, can I write to some of your tracks? You know, and here's a link to one of my favorite songs I've written so you can hear some of my other work. Don't give them 10 songs. Don't ever attach an MP3 to an email. Just give them streaming links. You can set up a private SoundCloud uh, with songs that you don't want out in the general public that you can send out links. Don't worry too much about um, copyright protection and that stuff. Don't be too precious with your shit, especially early on. The chances of you, early on in your career, writing some big smash that somebody else is going to steal and make all the money from and you get nothing is really, really low. I'm not saying that it can't happen. It's just that, you know, it almost never does as far as what I've seen. But... You know, you can copyright your stuff. I'm not telling you not to protect your stuff. I'm just telling you to not be overly precious about it. I see some people not sending out their songs for opportunities because they haven't copyrighted it yet or something, and I think that's ridiculous. Most people are not going to steal your shit. Get it out there into circulation. See who connects with it and work those people and try and, uh, you know, the... The number one most difficult thing about getting a major label cut is that the stars have to align. And what I mean by that is you have to have the right song for that artist that connects in the right way during the right period of their life that speaks to them personally, usually, not always. These are the easiest ways to place you know, but all of these things, you may think I have the absolute perfect song for this artist. There is no way they're not going to take this. And then you either get no response or they pass on it or whatever. And you're just like, how is that possible? This thing is a banger for them. How, why? And then you hear the album and it's like a completely different style. It's like anytime Kanye is a perfect example. People are always trying to pitch beats to Kanye that sound like his previous project. And Kanye never puts out the same project twice. So when he was working on Yeezus, which was like super electronica, and people are pitching him My Beautiful Dark Twisted Fantasy beats, he's not in that headspace to hear that. So you as a producer are slinging like, oh, this is a perfect Kanye track. And he's like, I'm on some electronica shit. Why the fuck are people sending me this? I'm just... Kanye didn't say that. I'm just extrapolating how this could go. Um, okay, next question. Um, so persistence is the key with uh, how, do, how do you get major label artist placements in, in the industry? Persistence. People want to give up way too quickly. Writers reach out to me. Oh, I would do anything to write with you. Man, they write one or two songs that we're like, nope, nope. And then they disappear forever, and you never see them again. I mean, did you think it was going to be that easy? Did you think you were going to write one or two songs, and then all of a sudden you were going to have riches and gold records and shit like that? Like, no, this thing is a grind. You got to wake up every day and work and treat this like a job. 
Um, okay, what else do we got? Uh, any good techniques or wise words that get the most important tracks in the song working with each other fast so they honor the song when there is no rough mix? Uh, I think the answer to that question is the sprint mixes, which I may do at the end of this broadcast. Um, and my sprint mixes are basically, I sell a sprint mix bundle and a few different lessons on ASO, Audio School Online, my school. Uh, and I think if you put in the work, they are the single most effective, best tools um, for... Where are they? Uh, sprint mixing. So these things, if you are not good at mixing or you are decent and you want to get your weight up, uh, this is the absolute fastest way to do it. And what I do is I, st I mix a song to fully to completion. And then I take that song and I stem it out uh, in six different levels of difficulty. Each different level offers you a completely different challenge. And the challenge is basically that you have 10 minutes to mix that song to completion and make it sound like a finished song as much as possible. A, s a really solid rough mix. And you would be shocked as a professional how often that uh, technique or that skill set comes super handy because there's going to come a day, if you're a pro, many, many days where you have an artist or a producer or a record label executive sitting right next to you and they want to hear whatever is happening with their artist or their song or whatever and it's not rough mixed yet and you have as few minutes as humanly possible to make that thing sound good because they're judging you every second or you can only send them away for 10 minutes or so, um, I think that, uh, to me is think about working fast. There was a time I did an entire jingle for Ford Motor Company. We did a car commercial in one hour from walk in the door, set up the drums, mic the drums, record the drums, set up the bass and guitar and piano, mic them, DI them, record them, and then mix the song and vocals one hour. That's the way jing that's probably still the way jingles are made. Um, but that was the way a lot of jingles were made back then. That's the fastest one I've ever done. But usually in jingle land, it was like with me, because I'm a record producer who used to engineer jingles when they needed them to sound like records. Um, I, you know, man, the 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 uh, jingle houses are like sitting in the middle of uh, the eye of a hurricane and watching just panic swirl around you because every pitch is so important to those people. Anyway, I'm moving on. Um, what techniques do you employ to manage the low end of a mix? What techniques do you employ to manage the low end of a mix? Well, uh, you know, cleaning up the crap when it's not doing things correctly. You got to make sure that you're baseline and your kick drum are not fighting each other and there's and you also got to make sure that your kick drums aren't fighting each other there's a great uh plugin called uh where is it uh called auto align i don't think i'm using it on this but i'll show you so it's sound radix auto align and what you would do is you would put this on one kick and another copy of this on another kick. And the this plugin lines up those two, the frequencies on those two kicks as closely as possible so that they reinforce each other and they don't cancel out. And you would think that two separate program kicks, even from two different collections, aren't going to interact with each other at all. But you you would be shocked sometimes at just how much low end you're losing by layering two different uh, kick drums together sometimes. And they're just, uh, you know, they're canceling the phase, especially on the low end, uh, and you adjust that phase and all of a sudden you have this big powerful low end. So that's uh, one thing to do. Make sure that your bass line is in tune and that if your kick has any tone to it, if it's like one of these kicks that's like, Doo, you know, that length of it has a tone to it and that tone might be a quarter step off of the baseline and rub terribly so sometimes i shorten the kicks or sometimes i tune things to make sure that everything is tuned together those kinds of things um so i want to talk about uh the, the 90s studio scene since i was going to do that um 
and uh uh you know i there are some things to to know i think the most important tech developments of the 90s of course computers we went into the 90s completely 24 and 48 track analog two inch machines uh and sometimes the um the the sony dash digital machine but it was all reel to reel tape and we left the 90s completely uh digital uh and the first album that I ever recorded completely digital was David Byrne from the Talking Heads. Uh, uh, it, I think it was 1998. Uh, the album was called Look Into the Eyeball. So I recorded and mixed the entire album and I played bass on a song and I played keys on a song. Um, and uh, uh, so I can't remember why I'm telling you this, but I think the um, the key things that came out that uh, Tech-wise, the SSL J9000 console uh, came out in the like mid '90s, around '94 and '95, and then eventually every single studio had a J9000, and I think they really set the bar for uh, audio quality. Uh, their mic pre's were fantastic. The, I mean, they ran super hot. You needed a, a completely separate uh, air conditioning room just to cool them. Uh, but man, what a phenomenal console. And the console that I use, um, this thing is like a baby J9000. This is an AWS uh, 900 plus. And the EQs are super derivative of the 9K. Um, anyway, uh, so the other thing, uh, this, the Sony C800G came out in 1992 and instantly became like the go-to vocal mic. It was back then, it was C12, U47. Um, I would use a MyLab mic sometimes on lead vocals. Uh, you know, U87 or U67 uh, uh, when you couldn't get something. Well, the 67 is certainly better. But, uh, uh, and then, um, all right, I'm taking too much time. Uh, and of course, the Empirical Labs Distressor came out in 1993, and that's definitely the most classic compressor of the last 30 years, for sure, for sure. Um, so, let's see here. Okay, I'm going to blaze through the rest of these questions. Um, hmm. Uh, what do you do to get that mid-range punch that all commercial albums seem to nail? Uh, is it, is that in the mix or something created through the mastering? I, I mean, I think mixing and mastering is certainly important to that, but I think it starts with the songwriting. Uh, and then it starts with, you know, then it continues with the production. The entire, everything you do really makes a, a big difference in how, uh, how that comes out. But if you if you're asking purely as a mixer, um, I think it's uh, you know I, I don't know how because everybody's like oh the highs are so crisp the lows are so big the mids are so present but, but you yeah, know that's what I'm going for so <laughs> um, uh, sometimes I will find I will put like a. Uh, the UAD Pultec Pro Legacy across the mix bus. It's the top uh, 2K band is, man, really great. And the 500 hertz on that is really phenomenal as well. Uh, I'll show you. A lot of times when I'm uh, EQing the mix bus, I'll go for 2K, 500, 8K is, is another one that I'm always looking at. I'll usually, you know, I'll, I'll sweep these frequencies and see which which ones are complementing my mix the most if this is across the mix bus and you know I'll boost or cut accordingly and try and shape the overall um, so I I try not to leave it to the mastering engineer I try to nail that shit before it goes out to the mastering engineer um, let's see uh, how do you know when to <laughs> how, how do you know when to charge the right price for mixing I assume you mean like how do you how do you know what to set your rate at? I mean, basically, rate setting is guessing at how much you're worth. the The trick is finding that sweet spot and sticking to it if you can. If you need the work and somebody's trying to cut your rate, uh, you know, 
there are times where you need to take it no matter what. But the thing that you don't ever want to do is take something that uh, you don't need to take that you know the business is wrong in. Because you'll you'll be stewing over that the entire time. You won't want to... It, it just... You won't want to do the gig if you take it with the wrong deal. So make sure the business is right before you uh, do it. And, and whatever rate you set, realize that some people are just gonna, not going to want to pay, pay that, and some people are going to be fine paying that. And, you know, uh, that's going to be different for every single person and adjusted accordingly, depending on need. Um, all right, next question. How to get in contact with artists to develop credentials? Um, man, good luck. Everybody nowadays is super, super isolated. It's really hard. It's, and now during coronavirus pandemic lockdown, you know, you can't even like uh, go to concerts or meet people at studios or anything. It's like uh, completely shut down. So, you know, it's a challenging time. Um, and I think the way to meet artists is to, to create great music and find a way to get it out there into the right hands and realize that you're not going to go from complete obscurity to a cut with future. It can happen. Probably not going to happen to you or me. So, you know, there's some, uh, there's a ton of legwork that you have to do, uh, in this business and either you have it or you don't either you're going to put in the work or you're not. Um, and most people who genuinely grind their asses off and put in the work and have PC, so I don't even know where the on button on a PC is, to mostly recording live instruments. Um, MIDI, anything MIDI is, is Logic. Uh, usually anything starting production-wise is Pro Tools. Um, uh, let's see. And, alright, so I think that's about it. Uh, to next question. I'd like to know your approach to drum mixing. Do you use sound replacement and sound reinforce reinforcement or parallel compression? Uh, I rarely use parallel compression. It's just not a thing that really connects with me. Sometimes I do. I'm not, uh, I'm not crapping on it. The people who use it effectively, great. I, I think that's one of the great things about, you know, the ability to kind of create your own sonic style of how what connects with your brain and what tools work best for you and things like that. And uh, parallel compression usually is not what connects with my brain. Um, drum mixing, drum replacement. I'll use drum replacement only when I absolutely have to. I really try and get as much out of the source as I can. Uh, okay. Um, how, do I, how do I tune my 808s? Usually with auto-tune. Uh, if they're slightly out of tune, like if you have an 808 bass line, and it's boom, doom, 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 you know, whatever it is. Uh, most of these 808 things are slightly to very out of tune. And uh, usually auto-tune on the bass setting in the correct key will... Uh, let's see, I have a... Uh, do I think the digital distressor, distressors measure up to the real thing? Um, I don't know. I haven't A-B'd them, and I think it's kind of back to the 1176s. I don't really care if it measures up to the real thing. The, the, both the, um, the UAD distressor and the slate distressor, and of course the Empirical Labs arouser, which is the closest to the real distressor, um, are all three individually phenomenal plugins. They do amazing things, and in really musical ways, so I, I don't, think about it in those kind of terms. I just think about it as like, is this a dope plugin? Does this do what I want it to do? And, uh, and all of the emulations of the distressor definitely do. Uh, let's see. Uh, da -da -da. I have a session that has over 114 tracks. Uh, this is the next question. I have a session that has over 114 tracks. What sort of things do you manage that, uh, manage that many tracks? Um, shit, I mean, 114 would be an easy day for me. Uh, I think you have to organize your sessions really well, color code your things really well, strip silence really well, so that when you're looking at your session, you can, without looking at your timing or anything else, you can see the general arrangement of your song, what's happening where, and that's going to speed up your entire workflow and, uh, and help you find the elements that you need to find quicker when you're looking for them. Uh, 
So, um, yeah. Uh, let's see. Uh, I think, well, it's 9-11, so we're, we're kind of winding down. Um, let me see if I can get a sprint mix together, and I'll just do the last ten minutes as a sprint mix. I'm not sure if I actually can. Let's find out. Boom. No. Uh, I started this, but I have to undo it. You're going to have to give me like 30 seconds on this. Uh, let's see. Oh, I got another question. Um, from Shally Champ. Uh, do you use multiple DAWs for different things? I think I just answered that with the Pro Tools for mixing and recording uh, vocals and horns and strings and guitars and things like that. Logic for anything MIDI. Uh, and usually if we're starting a production, we start uh, producing in Logic and it eventually moves over to Pro Tools to be finished. Uh, let's see. Mixing on another, yeah. Yeah, I find um, Pro Tools talks to the SSL really well. Logic does not. Um, so it's easier for me to maximize use of the SSL with uh, Pro Tools than it is with Logic. And uh, Pro Tools works best with a mixer's brain. So it's I don't find like creating anything MIDI on Pro Tools enjoyable at all in any way. Uh, but uh, man, I really love uh, mixing on it. I think it's a, and recording and editing vocals. I'm a big fan of too. Um, let's see. I think what I need to do is zero this stuff out. I'm gonna cheat a little bit and leave one of my routings up. I, I bust all of the. So this is a song uh, called "Hardest Button to Button." It's actually a, a White Stripes cover. Um, and, uh, it is performed by the Williamsburg Salsa Orchestra. Badass bunch of players. Uh, I wonder if I have my mix. Damn, I don't have my mix. I'm gonna have to post my mix later. Um, but anyway, this is like live Latin. This stuff is gonna be, uh, super fun to mix. But it's also a really long song, so, uh, I've got to be really careful to jump around quickly, set my levels, move on to the next thing. You know, again, imagine this is a sprint mix. Imagine I've got the artist sitting right next to me waiting to cut vocals, or I've got the record exec sitting next to me waiting to critique the song to see what they have or whatever it is, and everybody's looking at you, and everybody's tapping their their watch and going like, come on, man, you know, when are we going to hear the what we need to hear, so... That's what the sprint mixes train you to do. Be present in the moment. Rely on your gut and your instincts and uh, and get shit down. So, um, timer, 10 minutes. From faders down to hopefully somewhat finished. And that'll be the end of the broadcast. So, thank you for tuning in, everybody. Uh, I'll be back maybe Wednesday night, uh, 8 p.m. Uh, please like and share. Uh, if you haven't subscribed to the YouTube channel yet, we're brand new. I'm going to be building this over time. It's going to take a while. Uh, and uh, you can start asking questions for the next broadcast starting tomorrow. Um, hopefully, I will see you there. So, otherwise, uh, I'm going to start knocking out this sprint mix. We have 10 minutes. I don't know. Hopefully, you can see that. 10 minutes on the counter. And... Uh, all faders down. No, all faders are not down. Hang on. There we go. This might be a little bit difficult with the computer sitting up here, but I'll make do. And that does not go down. That goes down. All right. Ten minutes on the clock. Here I go. Thank you for listening, everybody. Thank you for checking in. Uh, and uh, st stay safe in the apocalypse. I think uh, we hit, uh, at 5 o'clock today, we hit 140,000 confirmed cases in America. Most of them coming out of New York and New Jersey, right where I'm at. We are locked down and locked in. We are not trying to go anywhere. I highly encourage you to do the same. Flatten the curve. Keep the spread down. 
take quarantining seriously and uh, you know protect the the sick and older in the in the uh, population and yourself you know some young people are dying from this too and some young people are having some really really hard times recovering from this and it can cause permanent lung damage I've also read that it can cause permanent heart damage so this is definitely not the flu it's not something you want to get take it seriously and uh, we're in for the a long haul with this one all right 10 minutes on the clock sprint mix time Williamsburg Salsa Orchestra out of Williamsburg Brooklyn uh, commanded by Gianni Mano amazing amazing musicians uh, and a lot of fun live. Um, so check them out. Here we go. Uh, wait, 10 minutes. Start. There we go.
A dog in a box with something in it. A stick. A dog in a box with something in it. Set the stick. start to finish so what you notice with the sprint mixes if you're still with me is uh, uh, I'm not listening to the whole thing all the way through I'm listening to each individual section cleaning up those sections making sure each of those sections work and then moving on very quickly to the next section and then after I have everything into the mix I'm then listening from section to section to see how the transitions are and see where I'm still coming up short on my mix. So, of course, this isn't perfect. It's not meant to be. Um, but it's a pretty damn solid mix for 20 stems in 10 minutes. Uh, I've never done this one before. It's the first time I'm, I've mixed this. I, I did the original mix, but it was a uh, fully, you know, stemmed out analog, uh, everything across the SSL, and this is in the box. So, um, yeah, challenge yourself. Check out the sprint mixes. Uh, I'm going to be putting out a lot of them this year. And, uh, I will write out the rest of the broadcast with um, just printing this, and that'll be that. Hopefully I'll see you on Wednesday. Uh, stay safe in the apocalypse. I am. And uh, Ken Lewis signing off.
something